Repo, you want to see if we can switch over to you? So I'm going to uh, go to the presentation here. This is a 44-year-old gentleman who was actually transferred to our uh, hospital uh, from an outside facility after he had two syncopal episodes and had one week of dyspnea. Main risk factor was he had recent travel to Bahamas. And interestingly, he was kind of misdiagnosed at the other hospital. They, he had elevated troponins, and they thought he was having an end STEMI. He was given aspirin, low pressor, and heparin prior to the transfer. Here's the patient's uh, vitals. You can see his tachycardic, respiratory rate is elevated, although he is normotensive. Setting two liters, uh, setting 96% on two liters of oxygen. He has elevated biomarkers, as you can see. Lactic acid is kind of borderline. It's not, you know, truly uh, increased, but we're getting up there. You can see the CT pulmonary angiogram here to the right with a saddle pulmonary embolism, significant central pulmonary emboli, and an elevated uh, RV to LV ratio here. This is just, a, you know, some coronal images kind of looking at the same thing here. You see RV-LV ratio here being 1.5. S-PESI score is 1. So again, this patient has an intermediate high-risk pulmonary embolism given evidence of imaging signs of right heart strain and elevated biomarkers. Also had a composite PE shock score of five, and you know everybody might not be familiar with that uh, score per se. So just as a quick uh, review, it basically consists of uh, these six components here, uh, which are listed here, and each one of these gets one point: RV dysfunction, elevated troponins, increased pro BNP, residual DVT, central PE, as well as tachycardia. And you know this composite pulmonary embolism shock score has previously been shown to be associated with normotensive shock. However, what they found in this study was if you had a score of three or greater, patients had an increased risk of mortality, resuscitated cardiac arrest, and decompensation compared to a low CPES score. And I basically, I think this what allows us to do is sometimes we, you know, we struggle with some of these patients, you know, which patient should we treat or not. And when you, this allows us to further kind of risk stratify the patient with intermediate risk PE and help prognosticate patients who might have a worse outcome. So it might be something that uh, you might want to consider utilizing in your own practice. How do you guys view this? If you see a patient with three or higher, that means like you automatically stratify them into intermediate high risk and they go to the cath lab or? Yeah. So again, the intermediate high risk is you know, really based on, you know, presence of imaging findings of right heart strain as well as ele elevated biomarkers. And in a nurse center, you know, most of these patients are going to the cath lab. You know, we, try to try, we try to enroll patients and, you know, almost all those patients in a clinical trial if they're willing. But you, you sometimes get these patients where, you know, it's not very clear. Or maybe they're intermediate low risk, but they don't, you know, look great. Um, and these are the patients that you could further risk stratify them by utilizing this score. Uh, it's just it, uh, another way to further risk stratify these patients. Okay, I got you. Uh, so, you know, we got, uh, you know, again, a patient had a left lower extremity venous, uh, had, a low, had a left lower extremity DVT. Echo showed, you know, pretty much what we were expecting. This patient had dilated RV with a decreased RV function. He had positive McConnell sign. Estimated RV systolic pressure was 38. So this patient was actually enrolled in the peerless trial, uh, you know, very pertinent to the discussion here. And as, you know, we talked about before, primary endpoint was looking at this win ratio of uh, all-cause mortality, intracranial hemorrhage, major bleeding, clinical deterioration, ICU admission, and length of stay. And basically, you just basically had to have a proximal pulmonary embolism with evidence of right heart strain uh, of 14 days or less. And this is exactly what this patient had. So the, again, the inclusion criteria again listed here. Um, but in order to, the, the, in this trial, we wanted to try to get the patients that which were maybe at a little bit higher risk. So they had to have one of the factors listed here. And this patient actually had several of them. Uh, he had elevated troponins. Uh, he was tachycardic, and he had a syncopal episode uh, prior to arriving uh, to the ER. Again, this is not a, you know, a, a lot of people will say, hey, look, patient had a syncopal episode. This is a massive PE or high-risk PE. But, but but when he actually presented to us, he, you know, he was actually he was dynamically stable, and that was an inclusion criteria for the trial. So the patient was randomized to catheter-directed lysis, and uh, we always like, you know, as we mentioned, uh, you know, how we're doing these procedures, I always like to get access get a venogram uh, that goes all the way through the IVC, make sure that there's no clot on the way. Uh, we uh, went up with the angle pigtail catheter, and you could see the pressures were, you know, uh, pretty elevated, you know, higher than what we saw or we predicted on the uh, echo, 55 over 17, mean of 30 here. Uh, again, patients with uh, severe pulmonary hypertension were actually excluded from the trial, but that's uh, not a contraindication of utilizing the device, as we had uh, mentioned earlier. 
uh, we really wanted to kind of exclude patients with more chronic DVT. So this patient was treated with catheter-directed lysis, uh, with ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed lysis. Standard um, protocol, we, we use 0.5 milligrams per catheter. The patient got about 20 milligrams total. I think the average uh, TPA dose in the trial was about 16 milligrams. And there was no procedural complications. The patient you know, did fine from this procedure. Here's a patient's post-procedural CTA that was a part of the protocol. And you can see there's still, you know, while the saddle component is gone, it's pretty significant, a central clot burden still. The, the RVLV ratio, uh, you know, still remains dilated. Uh, again, just showing you kind of comparison pre and post and the RV to LV ratio pre and post as well. Now, I don't want to be a radiologist and just be make decisions on the basis of just imaging findings. So, you know, if we're going to choose to intervene, do anything further, I really want to see how the patient's doing. So this, the, the clinical deterioration criteria was were, were very well listed here. And this patient met, met several of these. You know, he had a persistently elevated heart rate. He was actually became tachycardic up to 135 while, with walking and talking. And this guy, you know, he's a 44-year-old guy. We know that he's going to have problems if we let him go home like this. He had residual dyspnea. He had inability to even walk to the bathroom. And, you know, as I mentioned before, we, we like to walk all these patients. And this guy wasn't going to do well. He had persistent tachycardia, inadequate thrombus resolution, as I showed you on the scan, and persistent signs and symptoms of PE uh, with lack of, lack of hemodynamic improvement. So this was a bailout. This was one of the bailouts that uh, was uh, as part of the peerless trial. So this patient was brought back. I happened to be out this day. So my, uh, uh, one of my partners uh, treated this patient. Um, here again, he's just putting up the catheter here. Uh, a tenopenia treated this patient, put a catheter up here into uh, the left pulmonary artery again, a significant clot burden, right pulmonary artery again, a significant clot burden, and uh, this is just uh, the, utilizing again one centimeter tip Amplatz guide wire, advancing the flow retriever, the T24. You see how well this thing tracks. Uh, it's it's a big catheter, but it tracks extremely well. And this is just kind of showing, moving from the right to the left, you kind of pull the wire back and the device just kind of falls into the left. And these are the post-treatment uh, uh, pulmonary angiograms. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but again, market improvement in the blood flow to both lungs. And this is some of the clot that he got out. There was market improvement in the pulmonary artery uh, perfusion. The vitals normalized. PA pressure is normalized or at least are decreased. And the patient, and most importantly, you know, all this is great, but his symptoms were gone. We were able to do a walk test. He was a new man, and he was actually very, very appreciative. He didn't like to have, you know, having to have gone through two procedures, but, you know, it, it is what it is, and this is sometimes what we experience. So uh, that, that was that. Uh, this is this is another case. This is a patient that I uh, treated uh, more recently. This was a 79-year-old woman who presented with two days of dyspnea on exertion, had some lightheadedness, and had a presyncopal episode. The patient did have a history of uh, unprovoked PE four years ago, her primary care physician actually stopped her anticoagulation four months ago, which you know, which I didn't think was unreasonable. Vitals were stable, although she did have some tachycardia here. And here's the patient's CT pulmonary angiogram. You can see again, a large central clot burden bilaterally, and uh, there is an increased uh, RV to LV ratio again, signifying right heart strength. Uh, right, RV to LV ratio is 1.3. You can see the patient had elevated biomarkers as well. Both troponins and proBNP uh, was elevated, although lactic acid was normal. Echo showed uh, RV dilatation with decreased RV function. The patient had intermediate high-risk pulmonary embolism. And we decided to enroll this patient in the PE track trial. And for the listeners who might not be uh, as familiar with this study, this is an NIH-sponsored uh, clinical trial, which is specifically looking at patients with intermediate risk PE and who are being randomized either to anticoagulation alone or catheter-based therapy. And this patient was randomized to catheter-based therapy. Hold on, what, in, what options do you have for catheter-based therapies? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, Chris. Uh, it's basically any FDA-approved PE device at the time. So basically that allows for uh, utilization of the Nari flow retriever, uh, Penumbra, uh, you know, uh, lightning flash is what we've utilized in the trial, ECOS, or ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed lysis, uh, the Bashir endovascular catheter. And then, you know, recently the uh, AlphaVac has been approved for PE as well, although at, as, as of now, it is not approved to be utilized in the trial. That might change in the future. Okay, gotcha. So uh, this, this is a patient that, you know, my standard, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when I'm treating the left pulmonary artery, we had already done the right side. The right side thrown back to me went fine. 
Went to the left pulmonary artery. My standard is taking a T24 up there and then taking a T20 curve catheter, which has a better angle, which is really well situated for kind of the morphology and the shape of the left pulmonary artery. And this is one of those cases where I did multiple, multiple thrombus aspirations and I just could not get this clot out. And it was, you know, I found it to be extremely frustrating. So in a situation like this, what you can do is utilize uh, these discs. Uh, this, this is a flow retriever 2 disc or FT2 disc. And these have an indication for peripheral thrombectomy. And basically you advance these discs. It's, it's almost like a stent retriever in, in a lot of ways. You, you advance it into the clot, you open it up, and then you kind of, you know, manipulate it a little bit, kind of pull it back and forth. And then after that, you go and then you do an aspiration. I had pulled, did one aspiration and the entire thrombus came out. So this patient probably had, you know, this is probably more of a subacute or even chronic uh, thrombus uh, in the left pulmonary artery. And without those discs, uh, which, which I don't utilize very often, you know, less than 10% of my uh, NRE thrombectomy cases. But just a, it is a good kind of words of wisdom for the audience. Hey, you're trying a lot of aspiration and it's not working, nothing's working. Consider those discs because it, it, it could be extremely valuable. Anyway, the patient had improved pulmonary artery pressures, had no ICU stay, was discharged two days later um, because she had to actually get the CT scan. And uh, I saw her in follow-up uh, recently, and she has no symptoms at all. So, you know, doing uh, quite well. And I think it'll stop there. Wasn't her presentation, didn't she just have two days of dyspnea? Correct. Yeah, she came, she came into a pretty pretty severe dyspnea. Uh, uh-huh. so when, when, she, when, she, when she came in, she was, she was not you know, looking very well. And this is, she was, I think she was 79 or so. She was a very, very active uh, woman. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, she's not, you know, some, one of these, you know, kind of bed-bound people. Sure, she sure. was playing tennis all the time, you know, doing pretty well. So as far as like uh, using the discs, I haven't uh, put my hands on them. Easy to use, any nuances to them, any things to be worried about, like um, where you use them or how you use them to maybe that could put you in a spot where you're getting into trouble or, or just any, any tips about them. Cause I know like when we talked about the Inari device, we've kind of gone through some like best practices, but anything to shed some light on uh, that specific tool. Yeah. I think, I think the, I think the main thing is just to remember, think about it um, is if you're doing a lot of thrombectomy, utilize all your main devices and it's just not working. Just think about it. Um, that, that's number one. In terms of um, the tips and tricks, I mean, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You, you want you know, again, all these procedures with NARI are always done over a guide wire, which I think allows for improved safety. Uh, so you're advancing this device over the guide wire into you know, kind of where the thrombus is. And only at that point do you open up the disc, which is just a simple pin and pull. It's very easy to utilize. And, and then the other thing is after you utilize, you know, you kind of do some manipulation there, you do, you do want to do an aspiration after that. Uh, because that by itself, just kind of pulling it into the catheter is probably not going to pull it into the catheter the same way that you might see with, you know, a, you know, a stent retriever for stroke. You, you do, do need to do an aspiration afterwards. Uh, so just something, something to keep in mind. I, one of my partners, uh, actually, he did a case. This was a, I, I kind of gave it to him. Uh, probably, he probably wasn't the happiest about it. But uh, Andy Niekamp, who's actually now the um, VP of Medical Affairs at Inari, it was a Wednesday morning, um, and one of our vascular surgeons was doing a thrombectomy. At, it was it was a large uh, renal cell carcinoma, and it was invading the renal vein. And during the procedure, all of a sudden, the patient became hypotensive, and he knew exactly what happened. They did an echo, and that large uh, tumor thrombus had just embolized to the right pulmonary artery. And I had clinic that afternoon, so I called Andy. I'm like, hey, listen, hey, can you take care of this? And you know, so they bring this patient up. The patient's you know dying here. Um, and he did multiple aspirations and got nothing out. And again, a, a situation like that, look, this, we're dealing with, you know, tumor thrombus there. And again, he, he utilized uh, those discs and again, got the, got, got the tumor thrombus out. So again, just something to keep in mind when things are not really working they, the way they should.